I'm going to be talking to you today about one of my favorite subjects, um, working memory and working memory assessment intervention in children with language disorders. So the plan for today is um, we're going to talk about working memory definitions and theory. I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I know a lot of people's um, eyes glaze over when I mention theory. Um, but it is really important when we want to think about how working memory impacts language development to think about different theories. Um, then we're going to talk about working memory and in typical development, what we know about how working memory is involved. And we're going to talk about working memory in children with language impairment, which is really our uh, subjects of interest. And then we'll get to the nitty gritty, what everyone wants to know about. How do I assess it and then how do I intervene? So um, I'm going to try to move pretty quickly through the first three points so that we have um, more than enough time to talk about the last two. So I wanted to start um, by telling you a little bit, just a little bit of background um, about how I became interested in working memory. Um, when I studied speech language pathology, no one really told me about working memory um, because I was focused on pediatrics. And working memory um, wasn't really a hot topic when we thought about language and pediatrics 15, 20 years ago. Um, it's always been important when we think about adults. Um, so I didn't really know much about working memory. I had the good fortune of working with a population of children who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Um, and what's interesting about these children is that they have this performance variability. And um, what happens with them is that when you test them with standardized tests, and by the way, these slides are not in your handout. These are some extras that I've, I've tossed in. I didn't want to bog down your paper and kill too many trees with this. Um, so what's interesting about children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is that Teachers and parents tell us that they have difficulty communicating. They have difficulty um, negotiating with peers. They don't get invited to birthday parties. Um, they're sometimes a wreck in the classroom. Um, but then when you test them, um, when you assess their language, they fall into the average range, often the low average range of um, on standardized tests. So it's, it's always been hard to pinpoint exactly what's going on with these children. Now, lots of people have found some great ways of assessing this, but at the time, we, we didn't know. Um, so I did a study as part of my um, doctoral studies looking at um, standardized assessment in children who have fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. Um, basically, I wanted to know if you look at a population of children who have social communication difficulties and you assess their language, can you pick up these difficulties? So do these standardized tests um, measure, do these standardized measures identify children who have social deficits? Well, um, what we found um, is that the children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders basically fell within the average range when you looked at the standardized normative data. Um, and we use the test of pragmatic language and the test of language competence. Um, and we also use the, the clinical evaluation of language fundamentals or the self. What we found was that um, these children demonstrated variability in sentence production tasks. So let me tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so we, the self was one of our inclusionary measures. Um, and then the test of language competence, which is becoming out of date, but is one of my most favorite assessments of um, language, of higher order language, um, we used as one of our uh, experimental measures. So the difference between these two tasks is that on the self, there's a formulated sentences subtest. And on that, you give the child one word, and you give them a picture. And their job is to create a sentence using the word about the picture. But it's just one word. Um, and then on the test of language competence, or the TLC, you give the child three stimulus words. And typically, one of those is a conjunction. So um, for example, they, they get a picture as well. So for example, there's a picture of an ice cream parlor. <laughs> and um, the words are some and get. And they have to come up with a sentence about that. So it really, uh, the TLC with those three stimulus words 
really forces a child into more complex sentences. So it's kind of a more difficult task. And what happened was that for children with the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, how they performed on the self-formulated sentences didn't really predict how they would perform on the TLC with the three stimulus words. So for the typical peers, the performance was similar. They got about the same scaled score on both those subtests. But for the children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, they fell probably within the higher average range on the formulated sentences, but then lower average or just below average on that TLC. So this got us to thinking um, that maybe this, what, what's going on? Why are they having this difficulty creating complex sentences when you give them many stimulus words versus one? And got us to thinking that maybe this is reflective of some kind of underlying limitation in processing multiple pieces of information, which is working memory.